I'm Lise Colucci, one of the life coaches at queenbeing.com, where we help you to discover, understand, and overcome narcissistic abuse in toxic relationships. And today I had a question that somebody asked that was, what if they aren't really a narcissist? What if I am not seeing it right? What if they're not a narcissist? What if I'm wrong? Understanding that what that question is, what if they're not a narcissist, is anchoring you back to an abusive partner. That question is an anchor back to the toxic person. All right. So one thing to remember is that what matters is, are you in a happy relationship? Regardless of what the person's diagnosis is, the toxic is toxic. And regardless of whether the person can actually change or not, if they are not actively doing so, we can assume they won't, okay? How much time of your own life do you wanna spend with someone who's a toxic partner? And how much of your energy do you wanna put into a relationship that is toxic? So those are questions to ask yourself. Here's some things you can ask yourself to know if you're in a toxic relationship. So are my feelings being validated? Are my needs and wants considered? Do I feel heard? Really, do I feel seen? Is this person able to compromise? Are they um, are they really listening to me? Not not just what they assume I'm saying, but are they really hearing me when when they're having when we're having conflict in particular? Okay, okay. So what's happening when you have is two things. When you have a question like that, and you know there's most people, by the time they have come to a place where they're asking me this question, they they pretty much know they're in a toxic relationship, okay? If they are in SPAN or another support group and they're asking this question of, of a group, they pretty much know that something is really wrong or else they wouldn't be in that group to begin with for the most part. So what happens when you when you have this question? Why is this question even come up? Why do we doubt our experience. There's two things, cognitive dissonance and abuse amnesia. And those two things work together as part of the trauma bonding process. And we talked about trauma bonds yesterday. So um, go back and watch that if, if you feel it would be useful to you. But so we can talk about what is cognitive dissonance. Okay, that's what we'll talk about next. What creates cognitive dissonance is the abuse cycle of the love bombing and the devalue as well as gaslighting. It really confuses and muddles up your brain. And what it basically is, is the holding of two opposing thoughts or two opposing beliefs at the same time. So I love him even though kind of thoughts or I can't ever trust him. He's not so bad. You know, like completely opposing thoughts or her. Can't ever trust her. She's not so bad. It's not just him, guys. A really confusing place to be in because our minds know better. Our minds know what's going on. We can even we can even name the behaviors when they're happening sometimes. But then at the same time, there's this total feeling of love and dedication and connection to this person. When that happens, you can see how the the question of are they really a narcissist? Are they really as bad as I think it they are? would come into play, okay? And then, so when you have the this going on, there's also something called abuse amnesia, and it's kind of similar, except that what it is, basically you forget the abuse that happened. And this is interesting. I'm gonna have to look at notes here, so excuse my looking down here, because I have to read this. It's kind of the more technical stuff of what's actually happening inside your brain, all right? So, there are some chemicals going on in your body, all right? Oxytocin. We know what oxytocin is, right? Oxytocin is the bonding chemical in your body. It is. It feels like love, okay? It's what gives you the, the feelings of love and, and bonding. Dopamine. Dopamine makes you crave. It makes you pursue. It makes you long. It makes you hunt. It makes you want something. Okay, it makes you desire something. It it's a drive. It's a driving chemical. It gives you the, the a feeling of a driving force in your life. It's a it's a we all need it, but when you can see when it's linked back to someone toxic, how this can happen. Then there's something called 
uh, androgynous opioids. And what happens with that is basically lack of them creates pain and use of them creates pleasure. That's I that's as boiled down as I can get it here. And then, and then there's cortisol and adrenaline, and those are stress hormones. Okay, so what happens is you have a cortisol reaction and a stress reaction from a toxic person having being abusive to you, or you're having you're being gaslighted or whatever's happening, and, and you have this stress reaction. It activates the androgynous op opioids, which then activates the dopamine, which then gives us the longing and the drive. And this is why we want to make break no contact. It gives us the longing and the drive to, because we have the pain from no contact. Um, it gives us that longing and the drive to resolve, to resolve whatever's going on. And as soon as there's breadcrumbs or love bombing, boom, there's the oxytocin. And suddenly this abuse amnesia happens. Why? Because it is much easier to believe what feels good than it is to believe what feels bad. It's it's defense mechanism to protect you from further abuse, even though it's actually blocking you from seeing the thing you need to leave, okay? So what helps with that? So you can see how that all related would create that question, what if they're not a narcissist? Because even though you know what's going on, you may have forgotten a lot of the abuse and there's why, that's why what's happening. Basically the abuse becomes a system Okay, and a system wants equilibrium, and the equilibrium is found, the balance is found in that cycle of love bombing and devalue. And that cycle itself then creates these, this cognitive dissonance and this abuse amnesia. So that's why we question it. That's why we question it. What it boils down to is it doesn't matter what they're called. If they're toxic, they're toxic. If your life is miserable because of another person, and it can't be resolved through uh, the means of normal and healthy communication, then it's over, right? There's no point. With, the, with abuse amnesia, forgetting feels good. It feels better to forget. And it's a defense mechanism to help you cope with the situation that you're in. So what would override that? To me, what makes sense is logic. Logic overrides it. You make a list of the abuses and you can't deny them to realize that what you're feeling is okay when it when it's negative even though it doesn't feel like the good feeling right so realize that feeling anger and you know all of the things we feel sadness and grief and all of that that they're things we need to feel in order to see the truth a lot of times when we ask that question is are they really a narcissist or let's just even say are they really toxic Right, we don't, we can't diagnose them. So, but we can look at the pattern of the way they treat us and realize is that a toxic pattern? So, in order to see that it is a toxic pattern and stop hiding the truth from ourselves, we need to feel what we feel about the actual abuse that happens, and and realize that when we're not feeling it, we're probably in a state of cognitive dissonance or abuse amnesia. Does that make sense? ways to get yourself back into the reality of the fact that this is a toxic relationship or is it not i mean it's, a, it's everybody has to determine for them, themselves the relationship that they're living in whether or not that suits their life and whether or not it's healthy for their life we can't diagnose anybody else so making lists of the things you find abusive is number one that is so useful for so many things it's useful in helping to break trauma bonds and it's useful in remembering remembering you know and write it down as soon as you can so that you do remember it and remembering that your logic needs to be listened to here you have to listen to the part of yourself that says oh, that actually did happen okay even if you're not feeling it this is the thing with cognitive dissonance your logic is telling you something your mind is telling you this happened this is this isn't right. It doesn't feel as bad as it should feel sometimes. Does that make sense? Like it doesn't feel as bad. If you heard it happened to someone else, you'd be enraged. But when you feel the feeling of it from having it happen to you, am I saying that right? Then it's sort of a numb feeling or it, it can even be like uh, candy coated, you know, so that you're not actually feeling the intensity of what it really feels like to be in that situation. That's self-protection, right? But it's also part of the cognitive dissonance. So listening to logic 
and remembering, okay, when I'm not feeling it, it's okay. I know it in my mind. I don't have to feel it to know it's true. Another thing is to talk to someone, talk to a support group, get yourself in SPAN or another group that is supportive and caring. Talk to a coach or a therapist, talk to, I, I never suggest friends only because for this particular matter, a lot of friends don't get it and it can cause a lot of hurt when your friend doesn't get what you've been through. And when it seems like they're telling you just get over it or whatever they tell you, well, you're better off without them, you know, and that doesn't really help in the situation because what we need is validation. We need validation that this whole experience lines up with something that is toxic, regardless of what we call the toxicity, right? We need, we need the validation from other people sometimes. So talk that when we have been in toxic relationships, and I will say this probably on every stream I do, because I think it's one of the more important points that actually keeps you safe and gets you healing. And that is that we need to build our self-worth. When we are denying our truth through cognitive dissonance and the abuse amnesia, I mean, we really are denying what happened to ourselves. So a part of us knows that that isn't healthy. A part of us knows is part of us is screaming, would you listen to me? Come on, what's the matter with you? Listen to me. And another part of us is saying, oh, it's okay. You know, and it can be really, a lot of people feel um, shame or guilt or like their self-worth drops because they're not taking care of themselves in the situation because they're, they're going back or they're allowing it to continue or whatever they're doing. They're not actually allowing it, but you know what I'm saying? That's how they feel. So as you build your self-worth, your understanding of of this can can change. And also as you build your self-worth, your tolerance for any abuse goes down. And that's what you want. You want your tolerance to go down and your standards to raise at the same time. And you raise your standards through experiencing yourself as being worth having standards for. Does that make sense? Thank you for being here. If you enjoyed this today, hit subscribe and the like button. And I will see you next time. I wish you well with your healing. And as always, thank you for being here. Bye-bye. <laughs>